You're listening to the Speaking Tongues podcast. I'm your host, El Sharice. Each week, I sit down to a conversation with multilinguals where we discuss and celebrate language, life, and culture through our own perspectives. Episode 40, Speaking Levantine Arabic. Hello, language lovers. Happy New Year. Happy 2021. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Speaking Tongues, the podcast in conversation with multilinguals. Today, I'm speaking with Carol, a Levantine Arabic teacher and the founder of NASMA of New York and the host of the Levantine Arabic Made Easier podcast. Friends, this conversation was so much fun because, as you know by now, if you've listened to this show for a long time, I love the Arabic language, and I'm always happy to learn about Arab culture from my Arabic-speaking friends. In this episode, we talk about the Lebanese school system, living in an international city in the Gulf, the differences in dialects of Levantine Arabic from country to country, and the advantages of learning an Arabic dialect over MSA, which is commonly taught in classrooms. I also just want to give a heads up and perhaps a trigger warning on this episode because Carol and I take an opportunity during this conversation to discuss the heavy topic of microaggression and racism that has persisted throughout the Arab-speaking world. I didn't want to shy away from this topic, and though it's not the most pleasant thing to discuss, it is a part of the reality. As you'll hear in this episode, we both encourage everyone to take the opportunity to learn about other cultures and educate yourselves on our ethnic differences. Huge thank you to Carol for this conversation and for sharing her language with me in this episode and for always shedding a positive light on Middle Eastern culture. As always, if you enjoy this episode, don't forget to rate and review the Speaking Tongues podcast on Apple Podcasts so that other language lovers like ourselves can find the show. Okay, let's chat. Welcome back to another episode of Speaking Tongues. I'm here today with Carol. How are you today, Carol? I'm good. Thank you, Elle. How are you? I'm fantastic. And I'm so happy that you're here with me. And we're going to have this conversation about Levantine Arabic. I like to start each episode with the same question. And that is, what is your first language and how many languages do you speak? My native language is Arabic, but I'm also fluent in English. I learned English in school when I was a child. And I can make you think that I can speak French, but I don't. (laughs) (laughs) I know those uh, first hundred words that I could put them here and there. And it seems like I'm really good with that accent. So people think I speak French. (laughs) I think that it's really common for like... um people to assume that Arabic speakers also speak French. Do you encounter that? Yes, that's actually very common. Once they know that I'm originally Lebanese, the first question, oh, you speak French? Which is very common. That, that is true. If most Lebanese do speak French, but I didn't grow up in Lebanon and I have to explain to them, it's like the guilt, why I don't speak French. I don't speak French because I didn't grow, I didn't grow up in Lebanon. I see. So a lot of Lebanese people, do they, do they learn French like in school or in their homes also? Yeah. So the schooling system in Lebanon is very interesting. Um, We have public schools, but public schools are, they're not the best. They're for poor people. And so you'll find that actually refugees will send their kids to public schools. On the other hand, you have either English school or the French school. So we don't really have like a Lebanese school. Like, of course, they're all Lebanese, but it has to be either the English system or the French system. So students will learn everything in English or everything in French. We uh, also, uh, I didn't do that because again, I, did, I didn't grow up in Lebanon. But if you are in Lebanon, you have to sit for governmental exams. And these exams are actually French exams as well. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. At what age does that happen? We have, they call it a uh, brevet. And I think that's grade nine. And then you have um, BAC, which is BAC one. And I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but it's, I, it's definitely grade nine. And then grade 12. And 
they're very difficult. And if you fail them, you have to repeat the whole year. I think they give you one more chance to do it. But if you fail it, you have to repeat the whole year. Wow. Yeah. And I think that ca- that came from the French system. Hmm. It kept doing that. Um, and, you know, in grade 12, it really shifts your direction to where you're going. You're either going into math and science or you're going to literature. So depending on the grade uh, that you get with certain subjects, this is what your major should be. I see. Interesting. So you didn't grow up in Lebanon, but I want to know where did you grow up and what was your language learning experience like when you were in school? I'm, uh, I'm Lebanese. My parents are from Lebanon. We're hundred percent Lebanese. I grew up in Kuwait city and, um, speaking English wasn't an issue because I went to an international school in Kuwait and English was the primary language spoken at that, at that school. Mm. So we, we had students from really all over the world and it was just easier to communicate in, uh, in English. So I didn't really have any, I, I, because I also get that question asked, like, how do you speak English? You know, like <laughs> they get surprised. And um, I just learned English just like how I learned Arabic, both at the same time. So I didn't really have to struggle to learn English at any age. When you were in the international school, did you have any classes for foreign language? They offered French. We had French um and Arabic was actually offered also as a language. And I remember I had to, because my name is Caroline, and people would think that I was Christian. Um, and because I had the U.S. passport, so I would tell the principal, I'm American and I'm a Christian, so I could escape the Arabic class and the uh, Islamic class. So I would just go hang out instead of doing the Arabic classes and the uh, religion classes, because you could either go and do Bible studies or you could do the, um, the um, Islamic class. And to me, it's just easier to go and do the Bible studies. I'll, you know, I'll just go there and escape those two classes. <laughs> so that played well in my favor because my name is Caroline and I have the U.S. passport. So the principal will be like, yeah, you know, they can't force me to do uh, Arabic or Islamic studies. That's funny. Yeah. So in, in Kuwait, when they're teaching, uh, they're teaching Arabic in Kuwait, they're teaching, a, like, are they teaching modern standard Arabic or they're teaching like Gulf Arabic? Um, they're actually teaching the modern standard Arabic, which is known as the MSA. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but everything else was in English. Math was in English. So we had, we took French every day and we took Arabic every day as like one subject. Um, there wasn't really anything called learning dialects. Dialects just now is a recent thing that's happening for the past few years. Everything was in modern standard Arabic. That's a really, that sounds like a really cool experience to go to an international school. It is. And uh, actually, I had to memorize also the Indian National Anthem because the school was British Indian school and we had to sing it every day. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know. I probably, I just know it and I don't know what it means. I just had to memorize it. What an exciting experience. It is. It is. I had, I think, um, I really grew up multicultured because of the school. We had students literally from all over the world. Like I cannot even count them. And it's just beautiful to be able to know about their cultures and their languages. It was really, really a multicultured society. Mm-hmm. Is Kuwait in itself, Kuwait City in itself, is it very multicultural there? Are there a lot of um, people who live there from all over the world or do they just come there to work primarily? Uh, do they come there for work or do they come there to settle and like raise their families? Do you know? Yeah, so you come there to work and then you settle there. That's like the biggest thing that you're looking for better opportunities from your own country. Mm. So uh, that's why my dad went there. Um, He worked there and we lived there and we just visited Lebanon twice a year. Mm. So Lebanon was, I mean, sorry, Kuwait was um, home to us. 
and uh, there's so many people from all over the world. But there's one thing that you would notice living in the Gulf, because I also lived in um, Saudi Arabia for a few years, mm. and I've visited many uh, Gulf countries. You would notice the class. We do have the class or caste system, and it's very noticeable. And it's, it's, it, it, it is very sad because it's too obvious. It is a very materialistic culture. Interesting. One day I really would love to learn more about the Gulf region because I don't know much of anything, but I am very aware of being in this Western news cycle that there are a lot of things that are misunderstood about that region and things that are completely unknown. Yep, true. Yeah. Tell me about Levantine Arabic. Tell me, for people who are listening, um, where is it spoken? How does it differ from Gulf Arabic um, and maybe even Arabic spoken in North Africa? And if there are any examples that you could help to illustrate this, that would be fantastic. Levantine Arabic is a dialect spoken in the Middle East, in countries like Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Palestine. It is very different from the Gulf dialect or the Gulf accent. In most cases, it's completely different words. For example, how are you in Lebanese or Levantine would be kifik in a Gulf accent that would be shlonech. And that's specifically Kuwaiti because that's the dialect I'm very familiar with. Hmm. Um, another example would be like chicken in Lebanese would be jej. In Gulf, it would be dayai or diay. Um, a lot in Lebanese would be ktir. In Saudi accent, it would be marra. Uh, so it is, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. But I think um, Lebanese, specifically the Lebanese dialect, it's very, very, very soft, very soft spoken if you want to compare it to Palestinian or Jordanian accent. And the reason is we don't really emphasize on long vowels. Um, we don't pronounce heavy letters, like any heavy sound or letter. We tend to pronounce it in a softer tone. That's why people would always ask me, oh, like, you know, when I hear Arabic, I usually hear it like very aggressive or rough. But when I hear you speak, it's not. And that's the reason why we just speak in a, in a softer tone compared to Lebanon, uh, Palestinian or Jordanian dialect. Hmm. And even the Gulf dialect. The Gulf dialect, it is very like masculine. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. I mean, I've always heard people say like Arabic sounds so rough. It sounds so, you know, because it's in the back of your throat, right? And me as someone who has tried my hardest <laughs> to say some of the letters in the Arabic alphabet, like it is so hard, but I've never thought that Arabic sounded like, I don't know, like I have just always thought Arabic sounded so beautiful. And people always say to me, like really, even friends of mine who speak Arabic would say like, really? Like no one ever says that, but it just sounds like, I don't know. I can't even explain it. It just sounds so beautiful to me. So um, now I'm wondering if maybe the most of the Lebanese, the most of the Arabic I've heard has been from people from Lebanon. So maybe that's the reason. I don't know. Yeah, it could be. Um, again, like for example, the different there's uh, uh, there's no really big difference between the Syrian accent and the Lebanese accent, except. Syrian accents, they do exaggerate on long vowels, like the A, the E. We don't. So for example, like let's take the same word, which is kifak, which is how are you for a guy. Um, for me, in Lebanese accent, I would say kifak. It's short, quick. In a Syrian dialect, it would be kifak. They, they like make it longer. Mm. But Syrian and Lebanese, they're very similar, except with, when it comes to long vowels. Um, for example, the word table in Arabic is tawli. The first letter you would hear is T, but actually it's a, it should be a ta, it should be tawli, but we don't say tawli, we say tawli. That's why it sounds softer. Hmm. I wonder if 
and maybe you don't have an answer to this, but I wonder if the softness in the Lebanese dialect comes from the influence of the French language. It does. <laughs> we are very much fascinated by the Europeans and we want to be mistaken for being Europeans. We don't really, um, most, in most cases, um, and that's the question always I also get asked, how come your name is Caroline or your brother's name is Joseph and your other brother is Michael and you guys are not even Christians? We just love that, you know, and it is true. Um, and we actually have a very famous slogan and you would find it uh, in mugs and t-shirts if you're ever visiting Lebanon in touristic places. It would be, hi, kifak sava. So it's like a, a dialect or a culture that speaks three languages. Hello, how are you? You're good. You know, like they mixed English, Arabic, and French. And I think, yes, that is true. It's funny because that's how I learned to say hello in Arabic. Um, in the last episode that I had, um, that the, on the first Arabic episode that I had. And I didn't even really notice that that was the mixture of three different languages. Yeah. And according to my sister, now they're trying to put some Spanish in there. So now they don't say yes or we or a, they say si. <laughs> That's so cosmopolitan. I love that. Yeah, it is. You know, we, we, it's like, it's beautiful. <laughs> really beautiful. I love that mix of the culture and bringing it into every day. What are some cultural things about Lebanon um, that make it unique in the region, I guess, to, you know, set it against um, Jordan, Syria, and Palestine? Um, let's start with one common thing among Arabs, the strength of the Arab family. Family is something very important and plays an important role in Middle Eastern cultures. Sometimes it's a headache, but when it's not, it's absolutely beautiful. And what I mean by headache, I mean like when everyone knows the limit, you know, um, because we tend to like really like, um, it's like even if you were, we're not living together, everyone has to know everyone's business. And my mom, if there's a news, she would wake up in the morning and she would call her two sisters. And after that, she'll start with the best friends. And everyone has to know about it, which is sometimes it's beautiful because that's like a support system. Um, so family, the family bond is a common thing in all Middle Eastern culture. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of differences, Lebanon is the most liberal among all. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the diversity that exists in Lebanon. We have 18 religions and sects. And Lebanon is a very, very, very small country. We're only, I think we're like 3.5 million Lebanese li living in Lebanon. We're more outside than in Lebanon. Interesting. So imagine 18 religions and sects in a country that is smaller than Connecticut. Um, wow. Yeah. So there's also a strong presence of Christianity. And our president must be a Christian Maronite. I don't know if you've ever heard of the sect Maronite. It's a, it's a sect that's from Europe. And he must be a Christian Maronite. He can't be anything else. Like it's specifically that specific uh, sect in Christianity. Huh. Yeah. And I don't think I've ever seen any Middle Eastern country that is that liberal for example, we have gay clubs, drinking is very common, and Lebanon is known for its nightlife. I think Dubai is next, you know, with all these rules and the changes that's happening. Dubai is trying to be like the next um, international country for expats. Mm. When I visited Morocco and Syria and Jordan, I noticed women dressed conservative. Mm -hmm. In some parts of Saudi Arabia, women must wear abaya, which is a long black gown. Right. And I've noticed other Middle Eastern countries, henna. I don't know if you've ever heard of henna. Do you know what's henna? Like the, the dye that... that yeah. So yeah. I've noticed in many Middle Eastern countries, henna is a big part of their wedding day. Mm. While in Lebanon, henna is not very common. I've heard probably of like one Lebanese girl that in, in my life that might have done henna on her wedding day. Huh. Yeah. Bottom line, though, values, customs, and traditions, and virginity, virginity, <laughs> virginity of women is very important. Yeah. 
That's so interesting. I would not have thought that Le- that Lebanon would be uh, the party powerhouse that you described. It is. It is. Actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was last year, according to, um, I don't want to say anything that's not right, but if I'm not mistaken, I think the CNN, uh, Lebanon was in the top 10 countries for nightlife, if it's not last year, the year before. So it's it's very, very much known in, in the nightlife and the, in the nightclubs and parties. You know, we are party animals. We love to party. <laughs> How much fun. On a less fun note, we talked about microaggressions in the Arab community. Um, I know that I did a little bit of research the past few days to just try to get an understanding of this topic and, um, you know, because I knew we wanted to talk about it. But you mentioned that there are some microaggressions, prejudices, et cetera, within the Arab community. Can you tell us what form they take and what sort of problem problems this creates between Arabic speakers of different countries? Yeah, um, you know, this is a very heavy topic, and uh, but I, I'm very happy to talk about it. Um, there's a very famous Lebanese uh, chocolate called Ras Al Abid, and Ras Al Abid literally translates to to head of the slave. And that's a chocolate that I grew up buying and eating, and every I'm sure every single Lebanese person that lived in the Middle East have eaten and bought that chocolate. It's a biscuit topped with marshmallows and covered in chocolate. And only a few years ago, just a few years ago, maybe like four years ago or so, an organization decided to fight and change the name. And now it's called Abu Tarbush. Mm -hmm. Jordan has a very similar chocolate called Sambo. But this one, they actually drew an African man on it. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when I was also doing the research about this, I came across something, you know, I, I knew it, but it's like, it just became so norm with those names, Hmm. like peanuts, peanuts, uh, as casual as the name might sound, hold a different name in the Arab world. Apparently after the Spanish invaded South America, where peanuts were being grown, they took back this plant to Africa where Africans would plant them. The name is actually Fisto Abid which literally translates to slaves peanuts. Wow. Yeah. And many people till this moment use the word abid, which translates to slave in Arabic when they want to call a black person. Like that's the, that I, I, that's the word that many of my family members use it because that's the word that's in Arabic. You know what I mean? Like that's how we say bl- a black person. Um, and then, like, it really, it's a very unfortunate. Like, I have goosebumps even thinking about it. Yeah. So what have you noticed, I guess, that, and I'll get to the second part of it, but what have you noticed in recent years, if at all, um, aside from changing the name of the, the treats and the candies, what have you noticed about changing attitudes? I guess I'm asking... Do people, you know, these are names that um, are being used against people of African descent. And I guess I'm wondering nowadays with maybe younger generations or with changing views in the world, do you see the, the views on the, in, you know, in the Black community in the Arab world, do you see that people are becoming more tolerant, becoming more open? They are for sure. They are for sure. But there's also one important thing is that, especially I, I can talk about Lebanon, I can't talk about any other Middle Eastern countries. But in Lebanon, it's very common for us to have, we call them maids. And it's very common for us to have to have maids come from Africa, Sri Lanka, Ethiopia, and they live with us for at least three years, the contract is three years. So it's like, it's, you know, like what I'm trying to say is that imagine you, it's, it's still that where you bring people from outside that serve you and they live with you for three years. And 
people, there's, there's an organization that's trying to fight and give rights for these uh, labor workers at least like a Sunday off because they don't take any off. Oh. They work and in many cases, they're not even allowed to leave the house because the woman is afraid that this woman is going to go and fall in love with a guy and get pregnant. And, and it's a big headache, you know? Mm-hmm. So they, they bring them, they live with us, they sleep with us, but like there's not, they really don't have any rights. And um, so I would say when that changes, then I could say, yeah, we are, we are changing. But, but as long as that still exists and they don't have like rights, at least a Sunday off. Of course, there are families that do give Sundays off and they let them go out. But there's so many families that don't. And I know so many people that don't let them have any Sunday off. For example, only, only like, um, and, I'm, and I'm talking because I, many of my family members, they have, they have them, they, and I see how they're treated. And actually I made uh, an episode about it on, in my podcast where they give them certain plate and certain cup that they can use. They eat in their room. They don't have a cell phone. And, and it's, it's, it just, they made it sound like it's a norm. Like we can't trust them. We can't do this. We can do that. But they're the one who's cooking the food. Mm. And who's looking after your kids because you know you have kids and then you leave the kids with the with with this worker so you can't trust her eating with a different plate from a different plate but you trust her with your own child you'll lock up your closet because she, you're worried that she's gonna steal your gold but you it's okay for her to sleep in your own house at night you know what i mean yeah. so as long as we have these um these things that exist i don't think we really made any progress yet i don't see it wow yeah it's really unfortunate um it's a it's a huge topic but but also on the other hand um the arab world is so busy with its own problems like i don't know where they can start with speaking of lebanon women rights no women rights forget that especially when it comes to divorce and custodies forget about that. You have the labor right. Also forget about that. Um, civil, civil war every now and then, you know, there's something going on, wars, um, attacks. So it's just, there's so much going on in this such a small country that we don't really know how to start and where to start. And so when it comes to Arabs, their priorities are let's fix ourselves first Mm. because there's so much on a plate but you know what someone has to start like we can't just like we've been in our and we've been in the same position for so many years and changing the chocolate name is great but like there's so much to it there's 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 like people's lives involved when you bring a labor and she has no rights that's that's like the that's like a big thing that we need to start and actually when um I don't know if you've heard recently what happened in Lebanon, the inflation of the dollars, because we do you, we use you as dollars and there was an inflation going on and people couldn't afford paying the workers anymore. So they dropped them off at their embassies and they stayed outside sleeping for days. Oh no. Because yeah, because they're, you know, they can't, I can't, I can't keep you in my house. I can't pay you. So many families and it was all over the news that they dropped them off on the, at the embassy you're not mine anymore. So I think we have a lot to work on a lot. Yeah. That's really just a piece of perspective that I don't think that someone outside of Lebanon, outside of the Arab community could really understand. Yeah. Really see, because as you're talking, I'm thinking about like, I, I mean, I'm not, you know, I try to stay as informed as possible. Um, I, I'm not the most informed person, but this is all, I, I'm at a loss for words because I didn't know this was going on. And it's it's always shocking, even though I shouldn't be shocked because, you know, so much has been, um, so much has happened with the way that people of African descent have been treated for centuries. 
But, you know, I think microaggression just exists in many culture, cultures and it takes different forms. Uh, there's always uh, an, an incident that I always remember growing up. My neighbor was Indian and her mother would always buy her, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the brand, uh, Fair and Lovely. Yes. And her mother was so obsessed with these creams because she wanted her daughter to look lighter. Mm -hmm. In South Asian cultures, the lighter you are, the prettier you are, the the more likely you're going to get married faster. So, and also my grandmother, who still exists, who still lives, she's very young. um, She's very, very, very white. Mm -hmm. And she has blue eyes and she has blonde hair. And some of my cousins were born with blonde hair and colored eyes, and some were not, including myself. I'm white, but I'm brunette. So I don't have that blonde hair or that green eyes that she wanted. And my grandmother would treat me and my brunette cousins differently. Hmm. And she wasn't secretive about it. She wanted us to know that her favorite grandchildren were the blonde ones. And of course that messes you up and your self-esteem, you know, and, but that's even, that's how my grandmother thinks. You have to be super white. You have to be blonde. You have to be either green or blue eyes. If you're not, I'm not going to like you. Hmm. And I remember also another story um, five years ago, a Palestinian mother who, who grew up here, you know, she asked me to find a, a girl for her son, an Arab girl. But the first where she said, Carol, I want a girl that's very, very white and bright, like, like super white. And then I remember I showed her a picture of a girl because I love, you know, I, I love to do matchmaking things. And, um, and I remember I showed her a picture of a girl Who's, who's just like, I thought she was very brunette, you know? She's like, no, 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 she's very tan. And I, I, L, I swear to God, that girl is not. And I'm like, whoa. Like, and I was like, I can't be involved in this. Like, I stepped down. I said, you know, I, I really can't help you. It just felt so weird and just reminded me of like how my grandmother would think. It just made me like very, very disgusted. I was like, you know what? Why am I even doing this? I don't want to be involved in this. Right. And I, yeah, I just think that they really don't know that this is microaggression or this is racism. It just became a norm to them. Right. And I think it's just the continued upholding of European standard that I think has affected all, everybody. I mean, Black, um, Indian, Arab, Asian, this proximity to whiteness that we think is i don't want to say we but as you know many societies think that the the whiter you are or the closer to being white means that you're you're good you're fair you're successful and everybody wants success in life right right um, and i just think that for a long time like a lot of our cultures really haven't take an inventory of ourselves and what we have to offer. And it's interesting because I was thinking about like, as you're talking, I'm thinking about like the fair and the the lightning cream that you, that you mentioned. Fair and lovely. <laughs> I was going to say fair and white, but I said, I know that's not right. Um, you know, when I watch like Bollywood movies, for example, and I see like all the stars in the movies, and I don't really want to get into a deep dive on this because I'm not like neither of us are Indian, but um, it's interesting how all the main characters and like the love interests they're very fair, and then like the villain or the police, like the crooked cop or you know the authority figure or something is always darker, and even those kind of I don't know how it is in in. Uh, Arab films um, because I haven't seen very many of them but um, this kind of you know subversive just like brainwashing of of generations of people who were just raised to think this way Um, and it's like none of us can do anything about our skin color you know (laughs) like absolutely but, you know, there's something also, L that um, I've noticed, you know, like even when Hollywood wants to represent Arab people, they represent them on camels, they represent them wearing like white long uh, gowns, the men, they're super dark. Um, and, and 
that's not true. When I get asked a lot of questions, I remember once, like, and this guy was really, really serious. He was like, you have internet in Lebanon? Mm. You, do you like, you have cars? And I'm like, is this guy trying to be serious or he's like really acting dumb? Mm -hmm. There are still, there's still some people here in America that portray the Middle East as a very backward country. We ride camels. We live in tents. We don't even have a desert in Lebanon. Lebanon is the only Middle Eastern country in the world that don't have a desert. And, and it's, it's unfortunate. And also when I meet people and they ask me like, because I always say like I'm Lebanese, even though I'm American. Yes, I am American, but like I always find myself like I say, oh, my parents are from Lebanon or like I'm Lebanese. And then I get like that response. Oh, you're so white. Hmm. It's like a shocking thing to them. So you even get microaggression bit from, from people here towards Arabs as well as like that expectation of you being an Arab, you should be darker. Right. Right. That's, that's really interesting. And I'm, I'm happy that you brought that up because you're right. Like the portrayal of, especially after 9-11 was just like the worst. And I felt so terrible for, you know, speaking of my friends who are Muslim specifically, but Arab people who are Muslim or not, just like everyone got lumped together Everyone was expected to be, you know, a threat. And I just thought that attitude was so disgusting because, like I said earlier, you know, the Arab world and the community is so complex and diverse. And a lot of people don't understand. And I, I think, sadly, a lot of people don't care to understand. And that's a, that's a problem. That's really problematic. It is. Not caring. To, exactly. That's that's. That's right. You know, uh, you can ask questions. It's okay to ask questions, um, to educate yourself. I, I'm still educating myself about microaggression because remember, I grew up in that culture and I still do those um, maybe inappropriate statements. I'm trying to educate myself. I'm trying to read about it more. You know, we just have to admit it. Mm -hmm. Admitting it is, is okay. That's actually very brave to admit. And then working on yourself and trying to educate yourself, pick the right appropriate words. And um, it's not only that has to do with, with, uh, with the, the, the color of the skin. We also tend to use wrong words when we're trying to address people with disability. We actually use the word retarded in Arabic. And, and that, that's also awful, you know, but you just have to work on yourself just keep working on ourselves and trying to educate and it's okay to ask questions. Absolutely. So let me ask you for someone who needs an education on Arab culture, what would you recommend they do? Do they Google things? Do they make a friend? Are there books they could read or what do you think would be the best way or would be a good way for somebody who, um, who needs to really learn and, and understand about Arab culture and values and, and the region? I am a big fan of a director. Her name is Nadine Labake. She is brilliant. She had, she directed, she made, a, she, I think she made like maybe three or four movies. I think there's three, but all the, all her movies, talk about the Middle Eastern culture, the Lebanese, specifically the Lebanese culture. And they all have amazing and specific stories about how women is a portrait in the Middle Eastern culture or the expectations of people, racism. Because when you have 18 religions and sects in, in a very small country, it does create a lot of problems. Yeah. Um, you know, like you don't want to marry someone else outside your religion. It's better. Like, st let's, let's stay connected. Um, I definitely recommend her movies. I love the movie Caramel. Mm. It's beautiful. It talks about uh, women in Lebanon. It's, it's, it's very interesting. I also love her movie. That was her recent movie. And I got the chance to actually see it in MoMA. And she had a Q&A. She was present there. And, uh, and it was brilliant. And I love that movie because she speaks about everything. She speaks about the refugee problems in Lebanon. 
And she speaks about labor workers in a very beautiful way and stories that they share. And that the name of that movie is, I know how to say it in Arabic. It's called Kafir Kahom. I'm sure this is not how you guys say it in English, but I think it might be Kafir Kahom. I'm not, I'm not sure. But if you Google Nadine Labake recent movie, it's about a boy. It's uh, and like I think he's a refugee boy that that's trying to sue his parents because they brought him to life. Um, it's a beautiful movie, highly recommended. And also, she has another wonderful movie. It's called um, "And Now to Wear," and that in Arabic it's called "Halla Lawain." They're all on YouTube that you can buy, and they all have subtitles in English. Start there, like start with the movies because it's so it's it's very very true and um there's a very also amazing movie that i love it's on amazon prime it's called ready g-h-a-d-e and it just it's 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 funny but it's dark comedy about how people in a certain village uh thought of uh thought about a a boy who had a disability Mm. so i definitely recommend these four things start there and then, um, you know, the best thing is also to check out the organization, like their blogs, like Kafa, Kafa, K-A-F-A. They talk about women rights, labor rights. It's, it's beautiful. Like you go there, start there. And then, you know, uh, you'll, I'm sure you're going to learn a lot. Thank you for sharing those. Um, I'm going to try to find as many as I can and add them into the show notes so that people can just click and, and you know, get to see what you're talking about. I personally am going to do the same. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to send them to you. I'll send you the links. Amazing. Um, well, thank you for talking to me about that because I know that is not the easiest subject to talk about. And um, I want to, I think that was probably the most serious question that I have for you this whole time. <laughs> so uh let's talk about some phrases in arabic that don't exactly translate into english <laughs> yes um i love like i love the phrases that we use in arabic they just don't make sense but they're just beautiful and i i call them phrase a phrase that's worth a thousand words you know it's like you don't need to speak much saying that phrase just sums up the whole thing and i'm gonna share three with you okay the first one is la ijri, which literally translates to to my leg but when you say la ijri, that means i don't care but it doesn't make sense why would you say to my leg you know <laughs> I, so let me try it. la ijri? la ijri, yes ijri? okay i don't care you know um the other one that I also like is Rehna Salata. Rehna Salata? Yes, which means we went salad. And that translates to we're screwed. <laughs> because when you make a salad, you chop, 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 right? So <laughs> when you're screwed, you get chopped. Um, cool. Yeah, it's beautiful, right? <laughs> and um, I love also the one that says, Amrak Matirja. Exactly. Excellent. <laughs> and that translates to your entire age doesn't come back, but the meaning is you deserve it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. And like my mom would say that a lot to me. So for a girl, it would be Amrik Matirjai. And that's like when she tells me not to do something and I do it and it doesn't end up being a good thing. She's like, Amrik Matirja, like you deserve it. But it means your entire age doesn't come back. I love those. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. Yeah. So in Arabic, and I noticed as you made the distinction between, uh, because you're a girl, she would say it a certain way. Um, when you're speaking Arabic, does it depend on who is speaking or who is being spoken to that you use a, a different ending? Yeah, it's who you're addressing. Okay. So I think, I, you know, from my perspective, I think it's really interesting because I've heard, okay, 
I don't know if I told you this before, but I might have said it on another episode. Um, there was a time in my life when I when I realized I wanted to learn Arabic. So this was so long ago before the glory of the internet. And um, I bought a book, like Arabic for dummies, like seriously. And I didn't get very far because I, I was struggling, but also I was seeing the letters and I was seeing the words and I understood, you know, what the book was saying, but I didn't have any representation of how to pronounce Arabic. So I didn't know if I was doing it right or doing it wrong. So I, I basically abandoned it. And then I got older and I heard people, I did meet people who spoke Arabic um, and I, they told me, you know, nobody speaks MSA. And yeah. I think that as someone who's a learner, it must be daunting on some level to study, for example, four years in college, MSA, and then you go abroad to someplace like Morocco, you go to Lebanon, or you go to uh, the Gulf, maybe Kuwait or Dubai or whatever. How, and then you get there and people are speaking completely differently. Like how easy is it to make that transition between MSA and the dialects of wherever you are? Okay, let me answer that and then we'll remove the resources because believe it or not, there's not anything in dialects. Like it's, it's, if, if it's there, it's like cheesy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But with MSA, it is there because that's what we learned in school. So there, it's, it's, it's a language. It's like literature. So I'll talk about, uh, actually, that's a very good point. Okay, let me start with a story. Okay. It's very actually interesting what you mentioned about, yes, you spend um, years in college and you think that you're going to now pick a job in the Middle East and go and start working there. And boom, nobody speaks MSA. Think of MSA as literature. It's like Shakespeare. It's very formal. People don't use it to communicate with each other. It's very, very formal. You will only hear it in the news and official documents. Um, that's why if you really want to travel and be able to speak and connect with natives, you definitely need to pick a dialect. I know there's so many dialects and this comes down to where are you going? Mm. If you're going to the Gulf, you actually need the Levantine. People think they will need the Gulf dialect. However, the reason I'm saying Levantine because there's so many people from all over Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, that come and work there. There's only 3 million Lebanese in Lebanon. So if, obviously everyone is outside. Um, and then the war in Syria made people leave. So where did they go? They came to the Gulf to start businesses. Same thing with the Palestinians. You know, they are all over in Kuwait, in Dubai. So you are going to come across these people as well. Um, you're going to come across Egyptian. But the thing with Egyptian dialect, it's only spoken in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And same thing with Moroccan dialect. It's only spoken in Moroccan. If you decide to pick a dialect, I definitely recommend the Levantine because that's the dialect that is widely understood. When I went to Morocco in December, I didn't understand them, but they understood me very well. Because again, it comes to politics. Everyone is interested about what's going on in that region, the region of Palestine, Lebanon, Syria. You know, that's the hotspot. Um, people watch, we're just talking about how liberal Lebanon is. So obviously our shows are very liberal. You will see women doing the shows and, 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 and you know, it's like, it's like people tend to watch Lebanese shows. Mm -hmm. um, that's why it's a dialect that's understood by everyone, I would say. Um, and then I have a story that I want to share with you. So part of what I do is I also coach and train employees that work in companies, how to, um, of course, how to understand Arabic. What I mean by that is that I got hired um, several with several companies. And for example, uh, I worked with this company. They, they translate tweets and it's a contract between the government and they have to send these tweets in, to the government because they use them. 
and they actually have like less than a minute to send a tweet. Now, they, the staff, they're brilliant. There are Americans that graduated from Georgetown because Georgetown is known for the Arabic program. And they studied at least five years of Arabic, which is the MSA. Yeah, but when yeah. they were put on the job, the tweets not all the time are in MSA. The tweets were in dialects, in Levantine dialect, because these tweets were coming from Syria, they were coming from different places, and they couldn't translate them or they were translating them wrong. Mm. So I had to, um, to teach them how to translate tweets coming from the Middle East that has to do with like news and politics. And because like they wouldn't, like they couldn't translate them, they were stuck. And that's why if you want to study Arabic, start with a dialect, because when you speak a dialect, you will be able to speak to people. Then you can pick up MSA, because when you study MSA, you're not going to be able to speak to people. People don't know how to speak MSA, especially the Arabs who grew up here. Mm. They, don't, they don't study MSA at school, obviously, and parents don't speak MSA to them. So you want to start something that you can right away be able to practice it. So you actually have some incredible resources of dialect, and I would love for you to tell me about NASMA and what some of your reasons were for founding the center. Um, what are some things that you hope to achieve, and how have you been able to introduce the Arabic language and culture to your students? As you know, I've spent most of my life in the Middle East, and in 2013, I moved to New York, and I just fell in love with the magic of the city. It's so diverse. It's beautiful. And being so far away, it has been very important for me to feel connected to my Lebanese roots and remain in contact with my Arab culture. And I also understand the immense personal and professional value of being bilingual, Mm. And really through Nasma, which is my company, which is my baby, I would like to shed a positive light on the Middle Eastern culture through language, cooking, music, and dance. And um, when I started Nasma, I, I, I thought like, I really want to teach people things that natives say, things that natives eat. Um, that's why I didn't want to teach MSA. I mean, I do have a teacher that if somebody requests MSA, you know, she works with them, but we don't, we use just any other resource that's available in MSA. But um, I, we focus a lot on Levantine dialect and I have published three textbooks that teaches the Levantine dialect for the, for the reason um, that we're just talking about earlier the lack of resources for Levantine dialect. And I've noticed this because um, I've been noticing that people who speak dialects think that they can teach anyone that, that dialect, but that's not true. Mm -hmm. And I always, I, my advice to, to, to anyone that's listening to me right now, if you're interested in learning a dialect, you really, really, really need to do your, res uh, your research. And because keep in mind, MSA, we have textbooks, amazing resources for MSA. And yes, anyone could teach you MSA, you just anyone really, because they studied that, they know it, all that's left, do you like his teaching style or not? But when it comes to dialects, there's not much textbooks out there. And because it's so recent that people only a few years ago started like, okay, you know, seems like people want to learn that. Like that's the way you can connect to natives. Um, you don't want to walk in the streets of Morocco or Jordan and just speak formal or, you know, you just want to be able to, to connect to people. So we need to teach them dialects. So it's so recent that everyone is trying to come up with like why do we say, say it this way and in most cases well the answer is like I don't know my mom says it this way but that's not true there is grammar rules and actually it took me three years to come up and study how, why why do we conjugate verbs this way why do we say it this way and to pick up like, you know, like those gaps and questions that I'm going to be asked, why do you guys say it this way? And I, I, the answer should not be like, uh, 
I don't know. We just say it that way. No, we don't say it that way. There is a reason why. Of course, there's certain in certain circumstances. Yes, we don't like it is just said like that. But uh, it took me three years to really be able to come up with a curriculum that made sense for people. Because if you don't have the right curriculum, the right structure, you can you can't teach really anyone right. how to speak it. And my advice, if you're looking for uh, Levantine teachers, the first question you need to ask her, to ask that person, what's your structure? What's the curriculum? If he or she is going to tell you, well, you know, I create slides, I, blah, blah. No, you need table of context. You need to see that. You need to see the structure. You need to know that in lesson one, I'm going to study this. In lesson two, I'm going to study that. That's the only way you could do it mm -hmm. because people think because I speak it, I can teach it. That's not true. Right. And same thing with English. I, can you teach English? Not everyone can teach English. You know what I mean? Like I can ask you a question and you'd be like, I don't know. You know, I just, I don't know the grammar because if you're, if you don't study grammar, it's not part of your life where you're always educating yourself about grammar. You forget it. Right. Same thing with Levantine dialect. We do, we never studied the grammar of the Levantine dialect because we didn't have to study. We just heard it from our parents mm -hmm. and we grew up hearing it and repeating it. And that's how we learned it. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting because I'm thinking about a lot of, as you're talking, a lot of the conversation there is about African-American English these days. And some people have been talking about how it has for so long been seen as just like improper English, right? Yep. But it actually has a structure. There are grammar rules. And it's funny because even I'm thinking about it and I'm reading this uh, or listening to, I forget where I saw this and they're pointing out examples. And it was, it was a question asking like, what is the, like, what is the wrong way to say a certain thing? And I got every single question right. And I didn't even realize like, oh my God, this is a dialect that I know instinctively like, oh, that doesn't sound right. Or no one would ever say that. And I'm glad that we're paying more attention to dialects now because I think for so long, um, and I don't know how it is specifically within Arabic, but for so long, I feel like dialects tend to be downplayed and overlooked as like improper. Um, but we're starting to understand that this is the way that people communicate. Um, so there is validity in there. And like you said, it's really hard, even with, you know, grammatical, I guess you would say standard English. I studied grammar, I studied English, and I still have a hard time explaining to people who are learning English why we say things a certain way. I can just tell you it doesn't sound right. <laughs> right. Exactly, exactly. And I have to go and look it up. And then once I look up the rule, I say, okay, yeah, this makes, this makes sense. But I don't know the rule off the top of my head. I just know that it doesn't sound right. And then I want to figure out why. So, um, you know, and I you said like, it just sounds right. Um, the thing is like you in English, because we have wonderful resources, you can Google it and get the answer. When it comes to dialect, we don't have that yet. It's, it's not like, available but you will have it in msa for sure but not in dialects yet where you know that's why i was like if i want to make if i want to teach people my dialect and i want to make sure that they speak it i have to have a curriculum mm. and again it took me three years and l my grandfather um he has uh he has a phd in arabic literature and when I was like writing my books and trying to come up with like grammar rules and collecting everything in Lev in Levantine, I would ask him, he wouldn't have the answer. He was like, I never thought about it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But if I would ask him in MSA, he, he can give me the answer because he studied that. Right. But in Levantine, it was so difficult. And I'm still working on my fourth book because it's like, there's still so much to cover. Mm -hmm. And it's taking, it's taking so much time to try to, to like come up with rules because I don't want to tell people that it sounds better. 
Of course, there are certain things that the answer yes, we just say it this way, absolutely, you know, just like in every other language, that's how we say it. Um, but again, students perform better when they have a structure yeah. and they have rules and, you know, it just, it just makes them feel more confident and they know what to expect in the next session, the next session, the one after, they, they deserve that. I'm really happy for you that you've been able to do all of this. And before I forget, please tell us where we can find you and tell us about your podcast too, but tell us where we can find you and how we can get in touch with you if we want to take that step to learning Levantine Arabic. Uh, so my company's name is actually Nasma of New York Culture Center. If you Google it, the website is nasmaofny.com. But I, uh, I started something called... Um, Levantine Arabic made easier. And from that, I created something called a masterclass. And I also created the podcast and my Instagram page. Um, the masterclass is, you know, you could, um, it, it's, a, it's a different concept. I don't think it exists yet in Arabic where uh, you, you create a membership for $10 a month. And um, you get access to videos and weekly Zoom calls, group call, uh, group meetings. Um, and I, I recommend really, like, if, you, if you're really interested in learning words here and there, check out my Instagram page because every day we post one word with an audio and an example. And it's written in both phonetics and Arabic. So if you don't know how to read Arabic, you don't have to worry. We could just, you could just uh, read it in phonetics, like the English were uh, English alphabets using the English alphabets and my podcast. Yes. So um, again, you know, my, my, my biggest dream is to create enough and great resources in Levantine dialect for everyone who's interested. And I got, I always would, my, my students would always ask me, where and what's the best you know movies we could watch or like we could listen because we want to listen that's part you know that's comprehension it's important in your language journey right and everyone is shifting towards podcasts you know on the subway you have 30 minutes and you compute commute and you just listen to things instead of watching and I did some research and I couldn't find an educational bilingual podcast and I was like you know what let me start this why don't I start this uh, so I started my podcast a few months ago. I have 20 episodes. I just finished season one. I interviewed actually my students and it's beautiful to see my students who started five years ago or six years ago with me and how they speak like natives now. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's, it's, it's amazing. I was, I was like, oh my God, like these are, this, this is, this is me. Like, this is what I did. Like, and this is you, like, you're like, it just wanted to, it's like, a, I just wanted to give them my platform to hear themselves speak. And we, we, you know, we, we made dialogues together. We spoke about everything and it's the best part is it's bilingual. And what I mean is that my, I don't believe that if you want to learn a language, you should only speak in that language. I comment in English. I translate when I need to, because think about it this way. When you're, when you're trying to learn a language and the whole, the whole thing is in that certain language and you might not understand every single word, then you're going to be discouraged. So I know because, you know, I've, I've been teaching for 10 years and I know what words my uh, students or listeners might not know. So I, I comment every now and then just in case if they didn't understand one thing, they get an idea and like, oh, okay. Okay. I, I, I knew they were speaking about that. Now I can continue. I can continue listening. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also called Levantine Arabic Made Easier. And I'm overwhelmed with the amount of people that are listening just shows that really people are looking out there for resources. Yeah. Some episodes, I have the script on my website so they can follow it with me. If it's only me when I'm saying, when I'm like talking about certain things, I upload the script. When it's me interviewing just like this one, if I'm interviewing uh, other people, I, the script is not there. It's hard to like write the script. Yeah. Um, and for season two, I'm recording uh, for season two. This time for season two, I'm interviewing entrepreneurs that are bilingual, that are Arabs that grew up in the US or, you know, in any other uh, European or uh, Western country. 
mm-hmm. and we're speaking because I want people to to hear other dialects, um, other accents, actually. Uh, what happens in many cases that uh, students get used to their teacher's accent, and then when they meet someone else, it's like, I don't know, like she says it in a different way, you know? So this is a platform where I'm trying to give you all the accents that anyone could be saying. Oh um, my gosh, I yeah. can't wait for season two. Thank you. <laughs> And I really, I listen to your show and what I like about your show, I do like that it's bilingual. I love the conversations that you've had. And I remember there was one episode I listened to and I, you said it was your student and I was listening. I said, this guy doesn't sound like a student. He sounds like he's been speaking Arabic his whole life. And I thought he just did an amazing job. What I like about your show is I love the topics that you talk about because you talk about online dating, you talk about, you know, being stuck in traffic. Like you just talk about like everyday stuff that we're all dealing with. Right. And, you know, you're you're not trying to be formal or you're not doing the typical thing like, you know, uh, a day at you know, in the park or a night at dinner, you know, like you're talking about like real life stuff that is valuable to people who are trying to communicate in the 21st century. And I encourage everyone to listen to your show and I'll add it into the show notes as well. Carol, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. I had such a blast talking to you this time. Thank you. I, I thank you for, you know, having me on your show. I love your show. And it's, uh, I, I like, I'm so proud that, you know, I'm, I'm on your show. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. I like to end each episode with the same question. And that is, do you have any jokes, popular sayings, tongue twisters, slang words, idioms, words of wisdom or advice in Levantine Arabic to share? (laughs) You know, uh, we have a lot, but I'm going to uh, suggest one that my grandma says it and all the older generation, they said it, speaking of microaggression. uh, It's it's actually an advice that they give out, you know. They say, uh, it says, لِمَا بِيَخُدْ مِنْ مِلْتُ بِمُوتْ بِعَلْتُ uh, which means the person who doesn't marry from his own people will die from misery. Oh, <laughs> and my grandma, and you know, it's like, uh, what, she would say it when let's say a couple got divorced, like she's a Christian, he's a Muslim. And it's like, yeah, because it's like, it's like a known fact because they're not from the same religion. Of course, they're going to get divorced. So it's an advice that you hear a lot Mm -hmm. uh, from, from people in uh, like older generation. I think people now, our generation is like, nope, we're like, they're more liberal, you know? Yeah. So I want to ask you if you'll teach it to me. Do you think it's difficult to learn like right now? Uh, this phrase? Yes. Oh, it's easy. Let's try. Okay. Li. Li. Ma. Ma. The lima, like the bean. Lima. Ma. Biechud. Biechud. Men. Men. For example, men is from. So I could say Anna, which means I. Anna min Lebanon. I'm from Lebanon. In your case, you would say Anna min America. So we have Lima biechud min. Lima biechud min. Miltu. Miltu. Yep, like Miltu, like Malta, but instead of an A, O, Miltu. Miltu. Bimut. Bimut. B. B. Alto. Alto, yes. Lima biechud min miltu bimut bialto. Oh my god! <laughs> Try. Ah, uh, lima biechud biechud. Mhm. Men men miltu miltu bimut bialto bimut bialto. Bravo. <laughs> I need to start 
I need to start writing it down because trying to remember one word to the next is like impossible. Exactly, exactly. But it's like, I like to try and it's, um, it's important to me to try because um, it's easy to say, okay, that's hard. That's, you know, bye, talk to you later. But <laughs> not everything is going to be easy. So um, I always like to do that because I hope that people will try along with me or laugh at me or whatever they feel is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Thank you. I, I'm always going to try. So um, thank you for breaking it down for me and for all of us to, to try to say something in Arabic. And I got to work on my guttural letters. Um, <laughs> I really do. Carol, this has been a pleasure. And um, thank you for having the time to talk to me today. And in this context, what would be the best way to say goodbye? Ma salemi. Ma salemi. Exactly, which actually translates to beautiful meaning. Ma means with, salemi means peace. So with peace, ma salemi. Okay, well, Carol, ma salemi. Ma salemi, habibti. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. Yes, bye. Bye.